indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for coming. Uh, right off the bat, we need to move into executive session. So rather than have you folks vacate the room, um, I'm going to have us go into the break room. So we'll be rejoining you shortly. Will you be opening the public hearing at 7.15? We intend to. I move we enter into executive section pursuant of GLC 3821A3 to consider litigation namely James T. Connolly as trustee of the Parker River Realty Trust versus the town of Newbury Land Court number 18 MISC 000695. Second. This meeting will reconvene at the conclusion of the executive session. Roll call vote. Chairman Colby? I will be recusing myself. So, Mr. Costa, now's the time. I wouldn't include myself in the roll call vote, correct? You can vote to go into executive session, but you simply wouldn't participate in the executive okay. session. Okay. Chairman Colby, yes. Alicia Greco, yes. Chuck Fair? <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Damon Jesperson, yes. Welcome to Jeff Walker, yes. All right. See you guys shortly. Okay, thanks for coming tonight, everybody. Executive session complete. Uh, now we need to move to open the Bob Lobster public hearing. Uh, continued from 11 13 18 in accordance with Chapter 138, Section 12 of the General Laws of Massachusetts. Application of Bob Lobster LLC, 49 Plum Island Turnpike, Newbury, Mass. For retail wine and malt beverages only license. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, anyone here from Bob Lobster representation that would like to speak? That's us. Yeah. Right. Come on up, sir. Thank you. If you would stand over here just so you're somewhat in the camera shot, it would be perfect. Sure. That camera? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that one right there. Yeah. Right there. Nice. Okay. It's not fancy, but as long as you're in that area. Okay. Oh, thank good. you. My name is Attorney Jesse Schomer. I represent the owners of Bob Lobster LLC. And three of the owners are here tonight. Paul Rudy, Kim Sue, and Brad Delabero. The proposed manager of record, unfortunately, is under the weather. She has pneumonia, so she is not here. She was before the board previously when, when the license was, was approved. Um, I'm happy to give a, a little bit of an update in terms of the timeline uh, of this application. As you know, it's been continued a number of, of occasions and, um, as we were attempting to resolve some issues with the neighbors. Um, we were working together with the building inspector with respect to the zoning issue. As you know, the, the, one of the neighbors who is represented here tonight by an attorney uh, raised an issue as to whether the property is a lawful non-conforming use. And so what we've been doing in the last few months is we've been investigating this issue and, and researching the history of the property and the zoning history. And we've reached the conclusion, our opinion is that the, the use is a lawful non-conforming use. And we've requested Sam Johnson, the building inspector, to issue a, a ruling as to that effect. Um, so from our perspective, the zoning issue is resolved, and we expect that Sam will, will be issuing a letter shortly. Uh, so our intention would be to proceed tonight with the, with the beer and wine license application. Sam did also issue a, a letter recommending his opinion that the addition of a beer and wine license to the existing restaurant use would not constitute an expansion or change of that use, and so from our perspective, again, there's no zoning relief for that, for that matter. Okay, um, with that, questions from the board? Any questions or clarifications? Um, the letter that you're expecting to get from the building inspector, yep. when do you expect to receive that? I spoke with Sam on, I think it was, it was yesterday. Um, I, I would expect in the next week or two. The outdoor beer garden, that's been eliminated, right? That's, that's right. So yeah. I guess my understanding is indoor liquor sales to seated patrons, no beer garden at this point. Right, and it, it is beer and wine no, only, no, no liquor for sales. Any other questions? I continuing um, disagreement with it is uh, no bathroom outside for parties. I disagree with that. I think it should have an inside bathroom. That's my opinion. Any other? I'm just, you know, 
we're in the process of some questioning going on about, you know, Bob's Lobster and um, how relevant or pertinent it might take an answer from town council is the idea of having the building inspector's letter in our hands saying it doesn't constitute an expansion of use. How important is that to us? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I would say that whether you have that letter in your hands prior to acting on the application before you or you act on the application subject to receipt of that letter, uh, I think it's six of one, half dozen of the other. These are two separate issues, obviously related in some respects. Um, one is a zoning issue. Uh, this board has no authority to uh, reign over zoning issues. That's simply within the purview of the building inspector. Um, there's a process for seeking determinations from the building inspector. There's a process for challenging those determinations if one disagrees with them. Um, there's a couple of questions here. Um, one has yet to be answered, but I understand that there's a, a, a decision, a, a letter um, that is in the works relative to the non-conforming status of the property to begin with. I think the second question, the one that you just alluded to, has been answered, whether, um, at least by the building inspector, whether this uh, new use or the issuance of a, uh, a beer and wine license would constitute a uh, expansion of the non-conforming. That question's been answered, and Sam's position is that that in and of itself will not constitute an expansion. But that presumes that the underlying use is non-conforming to begin with. And that's... Well, I'm, I'm okay with not getting into the other part of that, but I hadn't seen the letter, or I had Sam, Sam, did Sam tell us that physically? No, we just heard it from the town hall. The letter? <coughs> okay. My understanding is that Sam did send in a, co a copy of the letter. I, I'm uh, sure yeah, I, I might have missed it when I read it. I'm yeah, sure I have a copy of it with me somewhere. I'm happy to hand mine in no. to the board. As long as, long as we get some track of that, I'm okay with that. Just, just to add to that, so, because I think it's important. Yeah. If you issue a license tonight, say, and it's determined by Sam that the use is not a protected non-conforming use and can't exist on that site, the license can't be utilized. So the idea that there's a chicken and an egg here and you've got to ensure that you've got the opinion before you on the zoning issue, I don't think that that's the case. Again, because even if you choose to issue a license, it can't be operated in an establishment that can't exist because the use is not protected. But well, you know what? I can remember reading that because I remember reading the front part. Thanks, Adam. Um, are we going to hear from the opposition? What is the... Yes. Okay. I just want to get through any questions or comments. The letter I see from Sam, this is what's confusing It was the me. one I missed. The front of it starts out. They need more information than the second paragraph does that's talk about the name. Yeah, because it's dated. Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought it was what coming. I'm sorry, you kind of threw me off a little bit. I two different letters. Additional yeah. letter coming. <clears throat> okay. There is another, there, there there is is another, another letter coming, but this one is the one that says not a change in okay. use, which is what I think is one of the principal things before us right now. Yep. So the letter that we do not have, what does that say? Our, well, I, I haven't seen the letter. I, I spoke with, with Sam. My understanding is, um, maybe just to back up this October 29, 2018 letter from yes. Sam, the second paragraph of which addresses the, the beer and wine license addition to the use. Uh, he asked us to go back and, and do further research in, in response to this letter, so that is what we've been doing for the last month or two. And we responded towards the middle of December, and Sam's letter will be in response to that. And my understanding is that Sam will be ultimately agreeing with us that the, the use is a lawful non-conforming use and has not been abandoned since it was authorized by the Zoning Board of Appeals. So that's a zoning issue, and that's not really pertaining to this board? That's correct. Okay, so that's what it's throwing me off. Okay. What, no matter, it doesn't matter what Sam's letter is. Second, this is the letter that's important. Yes. Okay. Anything else from the board at this time? Um, we'll move to public comment. Would anyone like to speak? Good evening. My name is Michael Tucker. I'm from McLean, Holloway, and Peabody. I represent John Hartman. And uh, Bill Sheehan was here in my stead at the last meeting uh, for purposes of the um, 
I understand that the board is bifurcating the zoning issues and the uh, and the permit issue with respect to the alcohol line, uh, line of beer license. Um, and I do think that uh, it was raised at the last meeting by Attorney Sheehan that the lack of bathrooms is a significant uh, concern for the people who live in that neighborhood, and it's a very tight neighborhood. The smells from the restaurant uh, are a serious problem, particularly in the summertime uh, in that neighborhood, and it's a very tight neighborhood. Those are all issues that are certainly within the jurisdiction of this board. Uh, the building inspector's opinion that the, uh, the addition of beer and wine to that enterprise doesn't expand the use, uh, we respectfully disagree with. We think it does significantly expand the use. Uh, alcohol has that effect on, uh, on enterprises, which this we know. Uh, and, I would, and I would suggest that the board has the, uh, has the right to take into account the zoning issue in considering the issuance of this permit. Uh, I, I have heard that there's information coming, that there's historical data that goes back to the uh, pre-existence of zoning in Newbury, um, but I haven't seen any of that. What I have seen is the website that Bob Lobster has online that says that it began in 2001. And that's when it became a restaurant, uh, or that's when it became a uh, fish market that eventually became a restaurant. It's hard to tell. But certainly uh, nothing that pre-exists zoning that permits the non-conforming use. Uh, that's not your decision to make necessarily, but it is information that you can take into account. And expanding the restaurant use with a beer and wine license of a use that is difficult to document uh, even under the best of circumstances with respect to its initial zoning uh, was enough to give the building inspector reason to continue the matter for now three or so months. Uh, I suggest that it's enough to uh, deny the permit until the issue is resolved. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? I guess I have one question for clarification. Is it is the restaurant BYOB at this time? Yes, sir. That's all. I just wanted to clarify that. I didn't, I didn't realize that until revealing all the information we have before us for this particular sure. meeting. Oh. So they're currently already oh, okay. um, no, yeah, I think it's discussion time. Um, so they're already currently consuming alcohol. It's just not being sold there. Yeah, it's BYOB. Hmm. Um, hmm. My feeling is that Bob Lobster has gone through considerable outreach. You know, because we asked when they first came forward, there were objections from the neighbors. They set out a plan. They seem to have met that plan. They've worked in good faith. I think they've. They've met the requirements we asked of them, and I think we should approve this license. If the ABA decides that it, they object to the bathroom issue or zoning comes down on a different place, as Adam said, the license won't be valid. So I think we're at a place where we can approve it in good faith, and if there's another legal issue or hurdle that's going to stop it for some reason, we'll let that be the one that stops it. Because what they, what we have asked, they've accomplished in good faith, and I think they have earned the right to their license. I kind of agree from a different reason with uh, Damon in the respect that our building inspector has stated that it doesn't deem to be an expansion of the menu, so it doesn't really, you know, following up on the footprint of the Words of the building inspector, then it doesn't offend me to okay the building my license. So currently, the the BYOB, and this is probably a question for you guys, um, is that limited to just beer and wine, or is that <coughs> hard alcohol as well? We haven't seen any hard alcohol on the uh, on the premise. Uh, I, I haven't seen that. I haven't no, I've only that. seen beer and wine. It's a, <coughs> and it's like moderation. It's definitely something that we'll be able to control, you know, much more when it's um, when, when we do have a beer and wine license. Any other questions or thoughts? No? No. We're stuck on the bathroom issue. Right. Um, that's a different. That'll be answered by us. 
Does everybody feel like they have all the information they need to make a vote tonight? Yep. Okay. Motion to approve the license? Second. Discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. So I know you folks have you know, expressed the willingness to work with the neighbors in the town if any issues arise, and you seem like a good and responsible group of people. Um, I wish you luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Motion to sign the ABC C license. Second. All those in favor? Uh, motion to close the public hearing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Move to close the public hearing. I'm just making that motion. I'll, I'll second it. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't asking for it that time. It's <laughs> just doing it. Grants, gifts, and donations. Uh, vote to accept $500 donation from the Newbury Port Five Cent Savings Bank to the Town of Newbury Library Gift and Donation Fund. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. $500 donation from Newbury Port Five Cent Savings Bank to the Town of Newbury Police Department. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 $250 donation from Tracy and Allen Lamport, Green Street. Motion to accept? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'd like to thank uh, the Newbury Port Five and the uh, Lamport family of Green Street for their generous donations. Yes, I think we should send them a letter to that effect. Yeah. Yep. A thank you note. Okay. Motion to send thank yous thank for you. these donations. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, we have green communities. Are we ready or do you need a few yeah. moments? We're almost ready. We have stuff to work on, so that's okay. Take your time. All right. We have some one day liquor licenses. I am going to accuse myself from those. Uh, just give me time. Yeah. Yeah. I can read, of course. <laughs> uh, one day liquor license, Mercury Brewing and Distribution, Old Newbury Christmas Tree Bonfire, Tender Crop Farm, 108 High Road, Newbury, Saturday, January 12th, 2019, from 3 to 9. Motion. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. One day liquor license, Caleb Novo, DBA Saintly Cider, Old Newbury Christmas, Tree Bonfire, Tender Crop, January 12, 2019, from 3 to 9 p.m. Motion. And discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. One day liquor license, Dan Clamp, DBA uh, 1634 Meadery, Old Newbury Christmas, Tree Bonfire, January 12th. 2019, 3 to 9. Motion. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. One day liquor license, Grape Island, uh, do DBA Mill River Winery, Old Newbury Christmas Tree Bonfire, Canada Crop Farm, Saturday, January 12th, 2019, from 3 to 9 p.m. Motion. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Anyone got any coffee? I know. <laughs> um, yeah, so you have to come back to Yeah. I think we're good. Are you ready? Hey, I'm ready. Yep. Is it okay if I sit here? Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay, so um, thanks for having me tonight. It's a pleasure to be here in Newbury. My name is Neil Duffy. I'm the Northeast Regional Coordinator for the Green Communities Division uh, for the Mass Department of Energy Resources. And I'm here to talk to you tonight about the Green Communities Designation and Grant Program and the potential for Newberry to become a designated green community in the Commonwealth. Um, so just uh, briefly, uh, the Green Communities Division, just so you know, it's important to understand that we think of ourselves as the clean energy hub for all Massachusetts uh, cities and towns. So. A lot of what I do and what we do revolves around the Green Communities Designation and Grant Program, but we do have other uh, programs and resources, so you should consider me and our office a resource for the town, whether or not you're a designated Green Community. Um, certainly, um, I work uh, for you as much as I work for the designated Green Communities. 
Um, the way that we provide resources is that we, um, in, for the most part, provide funding and technical assistance. And that funding and technical assistance usually goes towards clean energy, energy efficiency projects, um, EV, electric vehicles, charging stations, and projects at municipal and school buildings. So uh, some of the other programs that we offer, um, this is a brief list, but I'll, I'll get into the designation of grant program. Uh, we do also offer uh, meta grants, which are municipal energy technical assistance grants. Uh, those tend to fund uh, feasibility studies. So if you were thinking about like a microgrid or a solar project or a solar and storage project in Newbury, we could fund a study on the feasibility of something like that. Um, through these meta grants, we also provide technical assistance to help <coughs> cities and towns become green communities. And Newbury actually um, has one of those grants right now with the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission to help you become a green community if you wanted to utilize that. Uh, we also uh, are just wrapping up an LED streetlight grant program where we reduce the cost of uh, converting your streetlights by about 30%. And then there's an um, online energy tracking tool that's available to all Massachusetts cities and towns, uh, again, um, regardless of your green community's designation status. So the Green Communities Designation and Grant Program, currently we have uh, 240 out of the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts are green communities. We just named 30 new ones um, right before uh, the new year. Um, so and we expect probably somewhere 20 to 30 more coming in in 2019. So over 70% of the population lives in a green community at this point. We provide up to $20 million a year in grants and loans to the communities that are designated. Um, and the way it works is you have, to, you have to meet certain criteria, and when you do, you're designated as a green community, and then that makes you eligible for funding that non-green communities are not eligible for. These uh, grants go towards energy efficiency improvements in municipal and school buildings. Uh, just a little bit of a... Um, idea of where we are now. We've provided over $100 million in grants, uh, providing over $14 million in savings a year for the cities and towns, and a whole lot of projected energy savings and emission savings, the equivalent of taking about 3,500 houses off the grid or 7,500 cars off the road. Um, just to give you a sense of what some of your neighbors are doing, you are uh, surrounded by many green communities. These are the ones to your north, but also to the south. Um, you can see that like Newburyport and Amesbury have been in the program for a bit longer. They've been, been able to take advantage of not only their designation grant, but also competitive annual competitive grants year in and year out. I'll talk about that in a minute, but Salisbury, Merrimack, and West Newbury have been in the program for a lot shorter period of time. Merrimack was just designated uh, a couple weeks ago. So uh, the way it works is if you were designated as a green community, each city and town is provided a designation grant, which is $125,000. And then there's an adder based on the population and per capita income. And so in Newbury's case, it will be approximately $134,000 would be your designation grant. Once you spend down your designation grant, you'd be eligible to uh, apply for our annual competitive grants, and those are those have a ceiling of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Again, these grants tend to go towards energy efficiency projects in municipal facilities. Uh, so, how do you become a green community? There are five designation criteria. Uh, I'll go through them um, one at a time. And if you have questions at any time, feel free to ask. Uh, the, the third and the fifth criteria, I'll go into a little bit more detail because those are the ones that um, require a little bit more work and um, a little bit more explanation. So the first and second criteria to become designated are, are tied together, so I'll talk about them as really as one. Um, criteria number one is that you need to provide as of right, siting 
uh, for um, either renewable or alternative energy generating facilities or uh, renewable or alternative energy research and development facilities or uh, manufacturing facilities. So one of those three uh, you need to provide as of right siting for and then the second criteria is that there needs to be an expedited permitting process in place for such facilities. And expedited permitting means that it can't take more than a year for the permitting decision to be made. Um, so if I understand you correctly, we have a solar bylaw in place currently in town. Um, if we didn't want to change our, our solar bylaw, we could meet the criteria of, of the first one by, by creating something around research and development and expediting that process, we wouldn't have to change the bylaw we yeah. have on the books. Yeah, that's right. So uh, just, you know, I didn't spend an awful lot of time on looking at your zoning bylaw, but from what I've seen online, um, you have by right in your industrial zones, you have by right for research and development and for light manufacturing. Um, so. It seems to me that you meet that criteria. What we need in terms of the application is the town council would need to review your zoning and your planning department would need to review your zoning, make sure, look, looking at our guidance, make sure that what you have in place does actually meet it. Okay. Um, and then we need a letter from town council saying that the permitting process in place also is not anything um, that would take longer than a year. Um, the only other piece of that, of the application uh, part that we would need is um, you need to show us that within that district, there's actual space to put, to, to have it. some facilities like that, whether that's uh, in the form of empty parcels or undeveloped buildings. Um, and it needs to be 50,000 square feet uh, in aggregate. So if you have like 10, 5,000 square foot um, undeveloped spaces, so that's something that Usually we work with the planning department on. Again, I can't promise you, but from what I've seen, it looks like you would be in a position to not have to do anything to your zoning bylaws, um, other than just to confirm that what you have in place does meet it. Okay. So can you define what an empty lot is? Uh, nothing's built on it. So like if you have a, you know, a one acre parcel that has no building on it, that could, um, where a 50,000 square foot building could potentially be built and that you just have to show us that at the minimum you have enough space for 50,000 square feet. It doesn't have to be one 50,000 square foot building. So it could Martha, be in combination of. Martha, would you, this would be able to go along our sort of industrial corridor on Route 1 that or things like that? That business and light industrial, yeah. And do you think we have sufficient space along Route 1? Um, haven't looked at that yet, so that would be part of the exercise. Okay. So that, and that would be something that we would work, and again, with Merrimack Valley Planning Commission, we could, you know, between Martha and Joe Cosgrove there and, and myself and working with you, we would try to figure that out. Um, so I think that that's where that would be the work for that criteria, at least looking at it now. Okay. Now, what is the like stipulated definition of like expedited permitting? Did you, did you have a time frame? Did you say? Like, yeah. So again, it can't be more than a year. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so which usually most permitting processes don't take longer than a year. So I don't know what the permitting process is here in town. But if it's as of it's a, if it's an as of right uh, use, then usually yeah. that's not a. a Yeah, it would be site plan review, most likely. Yeah, and that's fine. So the third criteria um, is probably the most work. It's sort of the, the term paper of becoming a green community, if you will. Um, and what that entails is uh, the town would need to develop an energy, energy use baseline. So this is for all of the town's energy use. Um, municipal and school facilities, not residential, not businesses. So we would need to put together an energy use baseline and then develop a plan to reduce that baseline by 20% in five years. And um, what the way that usually works is 
towns will partner with uh, the utilities, in your case, National Grid, and National Grid has vendors that they work with um, who will provide audits of all your facilities for at no cost. And those audits can usually identify a lot of um, the potential projects to, to identify the savings that you need. So that's, the, that's sort of the typical process that, um, that we go through. The other part of it would be to be working with the town and the facilities folks in town on, on anything that's been done or maybe planned. Um, so the other part of it is that you can, your baseline can go back two years so if you've done anything uh -huh. recently um, that you want to take credit for, we allow you. So if you are applying in 2019, your baseline could be 17. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. so we would so we would allow you to take credit for that. The only other part of it that I would mention for, for Newbury is that being part of a regional school district, um, you don't have to include the regional school district. I would recommend at least um, thinking about that and considering doing that and including them. But you, you could, um, what some do in regional school districts is they'll, they'll only include like the Newbury Elementary School, but they won't include the middle school and the high school. Um, so that would be something to discuss further, but um, the, the advantage of, of including it, um, for one is there may be a lot more opportunity at those buildings. They're probably huge energy users. Um, and then, uh, Rowley's also considering becoming a green community. Salisbury is a green community. So if the three, if those, if your three towns all were green communities, um, and you all included the regional school district, you could potentially be applying for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars grant for those buildings. Um, okay, so we can apply sort of as a joint application, as long as all the towns. Um, our green school district. Yeah. If two out of the three do, you could apply for a five hundred thousand dollar grant. So, um, I think the the practical advantage to this path potentially could be that, um, as I said, those are those buildings are big users, mm -hmm. and if there's a lot of opportunity there, it may make putting your plan together. It could make putting your plan together easier because if if there is a lot of opportunity in those buildings, <laughs> then those buildings would account for a lot of your energy use. So that would be something that we'd have to look into. So currently Newbury Elementary, um, well, all three of the campuses of the regional school district reside within the boundaries of the town of Newbury. Yep. So I don't know, like I know, like the district doesn't own the Newbury Elementary School, the town does. Right. The district does own the other two buildings, so I don't understand how Salisbury or Raleigh could claim the middle and high school as their. Because it's a district. Because they're so they're paying, you know, for part of the they're energy. paying for part of it. Okay. So so you're all paying the bills. So the way it works, and the way it works with your baseline is, let's just say it's even, you know, thirty three percent for each mm -hmm. town. That's what you contribute to the regional school district. So you would be in your baseline. 33% of the regional school, of those of the high school and middle school, 33% of that, their use yeah. would go towards your baseline. Okay. So you wouldn't be responsible for 100% of the energy use in that building because you're, you're not. Okay. On the fuel efficient vehicles before we move on, um, say we're looking for a truck for the DPW or a fire truck, what constitutes an efficient vehicle a brand new efficient vehicle versus one that is not efficient. I guess my concern with that one is being pushed to one manufacturer or two manufacturers who can command whatever price they want for these vehicles because you're stuck. Yep. So, um, so that's the fourth criteria, and the uh, first important uh, piece of information to know about this is that. Emergency okay. vehicles and heavy-duty vehicles are exempt. Mark my answers right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so heavy duties, any so anything like a Ford F two fifty or F three fifty would be exempt, but an F one fifty would not be exempt, and it meets our policy. So that gives you a sense of the standard. 
Um, do most manufacturers meet the standard? Do you have to go for the highest? It depends on the class of vehicle. I mean, there are different standards for different class of vehicles. We haven't changed the fuel economy standards for this criteria since 2010. Okay, so um, most would be? So most fit, yeah. uh, um, but it, it is something, you know, that we, we reserve the right to change that criteria and part of the uh, agreement that you're making and, and part of the policy is saying that when you're purchasing a new vehicle that you're, um, you'll, look, you'll check into our criteria to make sure that you're meeting it because if we do change it, um, that's, part of, that's part of the policy essentially. And that policy um, would need to be passed by the, by the Board of Selectmen as well as adopted by the schools if you are moving the regional school district. Um, so that's, that's the fuel efficient vehicle policy and the energy reduction plan both need to be adopted by the Board of Selectmen um, and the schools, the energy reduction plan as well. Um, the only other part of the fuel efficient vehicle policy uh, that I'll mention is that you can't um, recycle vehicles that are exempt that don't meet the standard and use them for other more administrative purposes. For instance, if you were wanted to recycle like a Crown Vic police cruiser and use it for like the water department, that's not allowed mm -hmm. because that car wouldn't meet, doesn't meet the policy. So that's one um, piece of it that sometimes requires a little bit more discussion with um, department heads and, and, and usually the work involved in terms of adopting this policy and before it comes in front of the board is, is just meeting with the DPW, meeting with the fire and police, especially, um, and any other relevant departments, and just making sure they understand what the policy is and answering any of their questions um, and make sure that they're satisfied with what it is before it comes to a vote. Um, so that's fuel efficient vehicle policy. I didn't know if there were any other questions about about this baseline. Um, like I said, th this would be the most work and this is where the technical assistance with MVPC would really come into play and as I mentioned that technical assistance because um, Martha had, you know, sort of put your name on the list um, now almost two years ago to, to, to have that technical assistance available. Um, it's available to you now. Uh, which is great. So you could start um, very quickly in terms of putting the baseline together and everything. So for the water department, we also have a quasi-water department. It's not Town of Newberry. Does that work the same way that... It's, is it a separate authority? Yes. Separate, separate district. Separate, um, completely separate tax ID and everything? Yes. Yeah, so they wouldn't be included. Okay. Yeah. Um, so... The fifth criteria, and this, this also requires a little bit of explanation, so the, the statute, it says you have to minimize life cycle costs for new construction in town, um, and that's the way the law was written. Um, but the, really the only way that we know of to do that is to adopt the stretch energy code. Um, so right now, uh, there are 250 cities and towns that have adopted the stretch energy code, so 240 green communities, that extra 10 are, um, most of those are, green, are, are folks that are hoping to become green communities this year who adopted the Stretch Energy Code very recently. So um, again, we're talking about over 70% of the population now lives in a Stretch Code community. What does that mean? That means it's really expensive to build a house. No, that's, a, <laughs> that's, where that's, I'm not, that's yeah. not what it means. <laughs> so let me talk a little bit about what it means. So what the important, um, Really important two things to remember about the Stretch Energy Code is that it only applies to new residential construction and new commercial construction over 100,000 square feet or new commercial over 40,000 square feet when you're talking about condition spaces like supermarkets or labs. So any additions, renovations, or repairs would not be impacted by adopting the Stretch Code. So anyone redoing their kitchen, their bathroom, adding on to their home, um, nothing would change for them in terms of how they have to comply to the building code. But new homes would have to comply to pressure tests and, and all these things. Yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit about the difference between the stretch and the base. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
currently right now, if anyone who lives in Newbury who wants to build a new home, to comply with the base energy code, you have two options, and those are listed on the bottom here. So you have the prescriptive path on the left, which is essentially you have a checklist of compliance measures, and it also requires some inspections during and after construction. Those inspections are usually done by uh, uh, building professionals called HERS readers, Home Energy Rating System uh, professionals. So um, that's the prescriptive path. So checklist checklist of compliance measures means you know you need a, a boiler or a certain efficiency, you need insulation of a certain R value, that sort of thing. The performance path um, requires also those inspections during and post construction, but it requires modeling before the uh, home is built and by a HERS rater, and it requires modeling after that home is built, um, again, by a HERS rater, and the modeling will, um, will uh, predict the performance of the home, and then at the end of it will confirm that the home is performing as needed. And so that, again, those are the two paths that are available for anyone who wants to build a new home here in Newbury. And what the stretch code says is that you can only follow the performance path. And so um, in terms of the level of performance that the home has to meet, it doesn't change. It's just that you have to follow the performance path. Uh, one thing I also did notice in the materials was uh, our regular code, for lack of better terminology, meets the stretch code that was introduced five years ago. Yeah, so, so the stretch code, so the, the energy code changes every three years. Right, okay, then it was a three And year. so, um, in the, and the stretch code is based off of the base code. Mm -hmm. So, in 2009 was the first version of the base code where we developed a stretch code. And that was quite a stretch. It did include renovations and additions, and, um, you know, it, it was more expensive. It was a bigger difference. It was almost like a separate code, more onerous for building inspectors, that sort of thing. In 2012, uh, the 2012 version, the base code, the stretch code of 2009 basically became the base code, and there was no new stretch code. Um, so essentially they were the same. And then in 2015, which is the current code, um, which was adopted in 2017, a little confusing. Um, they made this change where it's not as big of a difference as it, as it was before, but there is a difference, and it's essentially it's the same code, but it's limiting in what you can do within so the same code. If we were concerned about new home construction costs, a prescriptive would be a better way to go. That so let me I'll talk about costs with another slide. It, I mean it it's that's not a yes or no answer really. Um, so um, why test performance? Why is this maybe a better way to go? One reason is that you, if you follow a prescriptive path, you're not necessarily um, guaranteeing that the house is performing the way it should. Um, and uh, the third graders are providing this third party verification. The other reason is that some builders uh, prefer to follow the performance path because it actually, believe it or not, uh, provides some flexibility. Where the prescriptive path has requirements that you have to do, uh, the performance path looks at the home as a system in a more holistic way. And so you don't necessarily have to put insulation in all the places that you would have to in the prescriptive path um, as long as you're meeting that HERS rating that is required. The HERS rating, who pays for that? The town, the state, or the, the builder. homeowner? The builder. builder would yeah, so the, if, if you assume that is passed on to the homeowner, then the homeowner, but it's, in the, it's the builder's cost. And so, and I'll do, the, I'll do a cost breakdown in a minute. Um, so a HERS rating, uh, the required HERS rating for a new home in the stretch code currently is a 55. Um, the, the HERS scale, uh, a, a score of 100 is based on a 2006 new home. And so a 55 is 45% more efficient than a 2006 standard home. Again, if anyone built, if anyone's building in Newbury right now following the performance path, they'd have to meet a, fi a 55. So the 55 is not a more stringent um, rating. It's just that 
you only can follow the performance path in the stretch code and, and you can't use the prescriptive path. So the HERS process, um, I'll just reiterate that what it requires is a HERS rater does some modeling at the beginning, that's step one. Then there are some in-process inspections and then there are our final modeling process at the end. And part of that is a lower door test um, at the end of construction. So everything in the red box should be or is required in the prescriptive path. So again, the only extra steps are the modeling steps at the front and the back. So not only would you have to build an inspector inspect, you'd have to bring one of these folks in to also inspect. You have to do that now. Zone. You have to do that now. And so you would have to do it still. Um, but so new home construction requires a HERS rating insulation it requires, inspection. It re yeah, it requires a, it during construction building inspections. It should be happening now with a prescriptive path. Mm -hmm. um, so the extra cost is not for the HERS rater throughout the process. It's for that added service that the HERS rater is providing with the modeling at the front and back. Um, so like I said, the people that are, that are doing these inspections are usually HERS raters. Um, so it's, it's, it's an added service that they're providing. So this is one cost slide and one example of a typical home that's heated by, with gas. Um, and this is the typical home that, that comes through uh, the Mass Save New Construction Program. These numbers were put together by ICF International, a consulting group that we work with that helps us with stretch code um, analysis and education. Um, so there's sort of a lot going on on this slide. Um, but let me see. So if you look up on the top left, you've got like the target is a 55. And if you're starting with a 66, let's just say a HERS rater models the, the construction documents and says this home's going to meet a 66, then the adjustments that would need to be made to the home along with the HERS rater fee would cost the builder $2,600 more. The utility rebates provided and the benefits would be about $1,600. And so you'd have a net added cost to this home of $1,000. Then if you assume that those costs are going all the way to the home buyer, you know, they have a 97 more dollars on their down payment and 77 more dollars in their annual mortgage payment and their <coughs> reduced energy cost would be a little over $200. So your cash flow for the homeowner would be positive from year one. <coughs> so this is for a gas heated uh, home, typical single family home that goes through the new construction program. We've done similar analysis for oil, electric, and propane heated homes, and they all come with basically the same results where the, the homeowner is essentially um, cash flow positive in the first year. Again, if you're assuming that they're, that they're taking on the costs, this is definitely an example, and I'm sure that there can be examples where you could show that maybe in year one, the homeowner isn't in a positive cash flow situation, but Certainly in year two or shortly after that, they would be. Um, but this is, so this is one example of, of sort of typically how it would work and what the added costs are to get there. Um, I'll just, since we're on to it. So this is a breakdown of, of where those costs come from. So you've got the, the $500 added cost of the HERS rater You've got more efficient windows, which would cost $500 more, a more efficient furnace, more efficient cooling equipment, more efficient hot water equipment, and then the duct leakage is just $200 as an estimate for um, doing a better job of making sure that the ducts weren't leaking, essentially. Um, so that's, again, one way to get there. Um, in terms of getting to designation, the stretch code needs to be adopted, uh, it needs to be approved by town meeting. Um, usually what we do, if it's something that Newbury wants to go ahead and pursue, uh, what we do is try to have 
uh, forums, public forums, and forums for builders. Um, certainly talk to the building inspector about it um, to make sure that everyone understands what it is and what it isn't. Um, and like anything that goes before a town meeting, just you know, education is key. Um, but this is the only um, this is the only criteria that requires a vote by town meeting. Now, how about getting out of it? Say some time went on, it wasn't the town decided that it wasn't for us. You can unadopt it. You can in town meeting. Yeah. Are there penalties? Nope. I mean, the only penalty would be you wouldn't be in community anymore. But we wouldn't take our, you know, we would not fall back. Our you wouldn't take the street lights back. No, we wouldn't do that. I don't know if we'd let you keep the sign. Maybe we would. <laughs> but yeah, we wouldn't. You know, we wouldn't. There's no financial penalty in terms of you just would lose your green community status. It hasn't happened ever. It hasn't. No one's ever unadopted the stretch code. So, the your first um, the slide back. What all the other towns around us? All those cities and towns that have adopted the green communities, like one. The closer up one? Yeah, so they, like Newburyport, that, Salisbury, yep. West Newbury, they all have this stretch code. Yep. They've all adopted the stretch code. Almost everyone in the Merrimack Valley, the white you see below you, um, you guys are surrounded by. Um, municipal life plant communities right. and a green communities designation is a little bit trickier for them so many of the remaining non-green communities in this region are municipal life plant communities but if you if you went just below that frame you know Gloucester, Ipswich, Rockport, uh, Salem, Saugus, Swampscott, Marblehead, um, <coughs> Lynn's coming in this year so essentially you know, in my region, in the Northeast region, which is 86 communities, um, there are 14 that haven't adopted the stretch code. Have not. Have not. So I think the point to remember there is that uh, unless you're talking about a builder who's only building in Newbury, for most builders, I can't say that, you know, for most builders now, they don't seem to, it doesn't matter to them used to they used to care about it more but now it doesn't seem like they care because they're doing it um, so again it requires forums and uh, education and talking to them about it I can't speak to all the builders and all the building inspectors so that's that's what it, it requires the uh, green community program is a concept was the original funded 200 million, would you say? So we are authorized to, f to fund up to $20 million a year. Yeah. Um, there was no original okay. $200 million. You just used the $100 million already. Yeah. Oh, we've, we have funded, we have provided over $100 million of grants <laughs> since, the community, since the Green Communities program started. My, my, my thought was, when all the towns and I mean, when all the states become green communities, will the will the program still continue to yeah. provide uh, incentives? Yeah, it's a good question and um, one that's asked often. I mean, certainly, the more green communities that come in, the more competitive the competitive rounds yeah. will tend to get. Um, what I can say about that is historically. Uh, we've been able to provide grants for everyone who's applied with viable projects. So last year, the competitive round was somewhere around a $15 million grant round. The year before, it was like $14 million. And we had, I think last year we had, I think we had like 82 applications. So 82 separate communities applied and we gave out 82 grants but we didn't necessarily fund every project on every application. And that may have been because they just weren't viable projects or it may have just been because of our budget. Um, I would say as a new green community, um, our, our division, the effort that we're making now is to make sure that the newer green communities can enjoy 
the benefits that the Newbury ports and the Amesburys and you know the other ones that have the frequent flyers, if you will, have enjoyed, um, and try to make sure that you can um, take advantage of the competitive round. So when we are um, reviewing applications, certainly the the ones that have been around for a while will be at the higher on the list in terms of what we're going to cut and shave, at least certainly in your first five years um, during your energy reduction plan. So that's that's the approach that we're taking, but it, it, is, um, it is getting tighter. We, uh, a couple years in, or initially when this program started, we were authorized uh, to provide $10 million in grants. And then the program got so popular after a couple years that the legislature doubled um, the amount of funding that we could provide uh, every year. So I don't expect them to do that again, <laughs> but, uh, but um, yeah, so it's a good question, but I think that certainly for the next five years, that's the approach that we're taking. So for towns like us, our lighting is gonna be more efficient anyway, right, Tracy? We're already working with MAPC right. on that. The lighting grant program, point. and we did already have National Grid out here to do for the, the street lights. The energy. So we're going to be ahead of the curve there. Yep. I mean, as we but said, if we can go back two years, that was that's right. Yeah, take credit for that. That, that, that. that was my next question, obviously. But the big thing too, I mean, we have to look at some of the little things. Stretch code. We have to look at it in, in ways that we'll see it, how it helps and how it hinders. I mean, we do recycle vehicles, so I mean, there's some things to look at, and then there's some very positive aspects. So other than that, I mean, there's not a lot of negatives to what we do every day. Well, we have some, we, might, we may have some new municipal <coughs> projects, building, capital big buildings coming on board. Um, so our energy consumption will probably go up rather than go down. Mm -hmm. How will that affect? So it's hard to it's you know it's hard to sort of put together your baseline and energy reduction plan in in a meeting. <laughs> but so there are, you know if you're one way is that if you're let's just say I think that you have maybe a new police station potentially you're building and so if you're building a new police station and um, it's replacing an old police station one way that we uh, allow to um, sort of um, make up for that difference is you can uh, you can adjust the energy use based on the square footage. Um, so if your current police station is 10,000 square feet and your new police police station is 20,000 square feet, then you would only be um, sort of counting half of the energy use of that new building compared to your baseline because we're trying to do more of a apples to apples. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one way where, you know, this new building hopefully <coughs> should be more efficient. And so if you're reducing the amount of energy use you're counting for, then it, it should hopefully help. Yeah. Uh, it's we not a guarantee that it'll be there because there are certainly more technology in new buildings and right. air conditioning. We and have so, no, no police station. Yeah. So we went so if you just add, energy. so if you just add a new building after your baseline, right. then it just wouldn't be in your baseline. You just wouldn't count it. Hmm. Um, so if we decided to start pursuing this today, we wouldn't be committed to anything. We'd be looking at whether or not it was viable, and we'd start to have meetings with managers and things like that to look at the effects it would have on our. Community. So at this point, the question is, do we want to look at whether or not this fits our town versus adopting it? Because adopting it would be something that happens at town meeting, correct? Mm -hmm. So I move that would be definitely a town meeting. I move that we look at pursuing this, and then if we decide it doesn't fit later, because we have a lot of other stuff to discuss tonight. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot to think about and discuss about this before yeah. it comes before town meeting. I'll second that. Any discussion? All those in uh, Any other questions? Are you, do you have more? No. That wraps it up? No, not unless you have other questions. Any questions from the outside? And anyone want to ask me a question? Mr. Wall. Yeah, Greg Wall, Electric Street. Um, where do you get the funding from? 
When did you have to finally get the money from? Yeah, good question. So it's um, there are two funding sources mainly. There's the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which are also known as REGI funds, and then there's alternative compliance payments, which are known as ACP funds. Um, and so uh, the simple answer is this is essentially a ratepayer funded program. So the, the funding is coming from fees that you're paying on your utility bill that the utilities have to pay into. Um, the the REGI program, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is all the New England states um, and a couple other states, um, I think it was like seven or eight years ago, started this cap and trade program where any power generators had to, um, couldn't emit over, over a certain limit, and if they did, they'd have to pay into this auction fund, and those funds come back to the states every year. The ACP funds are the utilities have to meet a renewable um, portfolio standard that the state sets, so a certain percentage of the energy that they're providing, the electricity they're providing, has to come from renewable sources. And to comply with that portfolio standard, if they can't meet that percentage, they have to pay into a fund. And so that's where it comes from. So it's not a uh, taxpayer fund. <coughs> okay, thank you. I'm sure you're going to have a lot more hearings on this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd be interested to hear uh, what, what a builder has to say about right. building a new house. Uh, Agreed. Yeah. On building on thank you. Yeah. Good question, Chris. Any other questions? Yeah, it definitely sounds to go along with what Chris says that the information has to be, you know, totally vetted because it's going to go to town meeting. So. Yeah, and the only thing I would add for anyone here or anyone who may be watching this meeting is that, the, in terms of the stretch code, is that there is um, a decent amount of misinformation about the stretch code out there because, as I was explaining, there were different versions of the stretch code in the past. So if you go home and Google the stretch code or stretch code FAQ, you might get an FAQ from the 2009 stretch code. And then it'll say additions and renovations do fall under the stretch code. And so that can be problematic when you're, that's another reason that it's really important to educate, but I would just say that if there are any questions about the stretch code, I would urge people to definitely contact me or contact your building inspector and go to the source rather than do a, a Google search because you're going you're gonna to come up with some conflicting answers there. Can you tell me what does the acronym HERS stand for? The Home Energy Rating System. There it is. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience tonight? All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. We want to take the vote. Oh, yeah. All those, we have a second, right? Yeah. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 what was the motion for? Just, just to investigate this further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so. mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Yeah. So I think we're, I did the, Okay, uh, no. review approval sign. I'm going to take one new business license and then I think Marshall will see it. We'll, so we'll have Marshall. Uh, review approval sign 2019 new business license application and new business license as follows. Dave and Carol Dempsey, DBA Plum Island Kitchen, 134 Northern Boulevard, Common Vic. Motion to approve license. Second. Uh, any the, discussion? Uh, oh, would you like to speak? Uh, yes. Well, I put in a simple business plan with that. It's just a, um, as you know, it's, it's, it's plum crazy. It's been vacant for quite a while. And um, uh, I come from the neighborhood. I own several pieces of property with my family. Um, I'm building a house right now on the corner of 748 and Basin. I live in 648 and Basin. Uh, my sister and I own a house directly across the street at 131 Northern. Uh, we've seen a lot of plans come through. We've seen a lot of things. We're concerned about a, a vacant commercial building in the middle of a residential pro residential community. Um, so we've spent a lot of time. My nephew Bill, who's going to be doing the uh, cooking, and has done a lot of cooking, and is a great chef. And, um, so we've really kind of spent some time in the community talking to them about what kind of business will be there. We know parking's been a big issue in the past. Mm -hmm. 
So one of the things that we've uh, come up with, the theme we've come up with, is really it's Plum Island Kitchen, let us, do, let us cook for you. So we really want to have it more of a takeout, uh, where people can come and get entrees, order during the day and pick up an entree at night between 5 and 7 on the way home. Uh, and Billy, it's, it's really about, you know, there's, there is seven parking spaces there with a handicapped spot. And um, so we've talked to the community, we kind of looked at in, on Plum Island and said what's not here. Um, you know, we don't want to compete with the restaurants that are there. We know Mad Moth has got a great breakfast and Beach Coma does well and the Plum, Plum Island Grill. So we've kind of looked at what's not available. Um, and we're going to the theme of being able to come in and do some self-service. We're going to like put a salad bar in, a soup station, a good coffee bar. Um, and also have in the summertime have a self-serve, soft-serve where people can come in and make their own Sunday or kids can come in and make their own Sunday. Again, it's, uh, it's not a sit-down restaurant. We realize in the past, I've seen a, a 35-seat restaurant go in there and fail and, and uh, the community has really been burdened with parking and people parking people's driveways and on people's property. Um, so we talked a lot, myself and my nephew, we talked a lot about the, what, what would work there. <coughs> and um, a lot of the community members, are, you know, the community area is very happy with this type of a theme. Uh, it's something that can service that end of the island, but it's also uh, something that can service vacationers that come and they don't, you know, want to cook out every night or they don't want to go to a restaurant, it's very expensive. Um, you know, hopefully there'll be the, 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 the norm of the island will be swing by the kitchen and pick up something for supper. So that's what we, you know, we're famous there. Um, we're not going with a beer wine license. We're not looking for a liquor license. We don't think that that's necessary. There's two uh, very strong uh, beer and wine retail vendors on the island, and there's no reason for us to try and compete with that business. So we're really looking to do a, uh, a takeout service and, uh, you know, uh, look to, uh, to service the community in that way, minimize the parking, but also be a contributor to the community. Uh, one of the other things that we've talked about, we've talked to local artists about having a place where they can really put some of their stuff, the crafters and the photographers, and, and put it up there so that people can come in and see their works and possibly you know, offer it to buy that. So we're, we're going to set aside an area for that as well, too. So that's the theme. Um, like I said, we've looked at it for a while. We've watched that building come and go. We've been here with it, been some crazy plans about people putting in two condominiums and all kinds of stuff. And we just felt that this time, uh, because we are so invested in the community, that would be a good time for us to really take control of what might be there and see if we can't make something work that's viable and collaborative with the community. I wish you all the luck in the world. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. One question. Yeah. Uh, since we've had some Plum Island overlay issues recently, how long has it been shut down? Well, it's been within the two years, so that's one of the okay. things. See, what happened was, and I went, that's funny that you said that, because we went through the whole thing. Uh, we went through the lawyer, Sam, and everything. It took about four, probably five weeks to go back, and, and Sam submitted the letter and everything. It's been cleared uh, as, as far as the non-conforming commercial use. But um, what happened was the, uh, it, it went from, when the realtor was using it, she put in a uh, certificate, and she did do her business, her rental business out of there and things. So it was never really shut down. She was intelligent enough to say, you know what, I'm going to keep the business certificate going in some type of a continued well, for usage. Yeah. And that's really what worked it out. So we were not, it has, has never been abandoned for more than, for that two, two year period. Very good. So. Relieved to hear that. <laughs> All right, any other questions? No. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Is there a, uh, I think we had a motion, so we're in discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate your reaching out to the neighbors and trying to mesh in. I think that's important yeah. for our business. And yeah, and for it to be successful in that area, I think that it's really something that's, you know, will we'll be accommodated to the area. You need know? the community. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. So, right. Good luck with the guys. Billy lives right across the street in 131, so he's going to be overseeing it. Right, right down in the corner. So if anybody has any questions, they can, they can come see us. Absolutely. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye now. Okay. Uh, Marshall. Yes. I'm going to recuse myself. Shocking me now. Oh, <laughs> Good evening. Sorry to keep you up, but I'll be quick. So I'm here to get a permit to take down our old barn, reconstruct it, and put it back up. But right now we're looking for the demolition permit. We've already taken down part of the L that was on the barn. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've gone through the planning department. 
so this complies with our order of conditions on the subdivision of Marsh Meadow. And we just have to come before you and, and uh, get that issue so that we can take it Lamar, we're going to take it away, it's going to the antique farm company, make all of the pieces that are going to put it back together, fix the foundation and some of the groundwork so that it's going to go back right and then we put it back up. That's exciting. I can't wait to see it. So, a little different. Um, windows are going to come out of it. It's not clear that it had windows when it was first done. We have a couple of questions that came up from the Historical Commission. Um, basically about the, uh, the roof we are uh, going to put a light roof on. We're going to put a, a metal roof on. Right now it's got asphalt shingles, uh, but we're not going to return to asphalt, asphalt shingles. Any questions? I know, I mean, it had to be, <clears throat> I was thinking it had to be a year and a half ago. I went out there to look at it, and um, I mean, parts of it are in tough shape, <laughs> to, to say the least. That's true. So, That's true. I mean, it, it, it's in, the bonds are not, I mean, that's... That's, yeah. that's what I saw. And the historical commission had no problem with the metal roof, right? Uh, that, was, <coughs> that was, I think, the, the thing that they had the biggest question on, is what was the roof going to be? Mm -hmm. um, and we did some, there two parts to this. Uh, one was we had to go back and look at the guidelines of the Secretary of the Interior of the United States. That's a 240-page guideline for restoration and renovation. Mm -hmm. We fit. The one question was the roof. And so we, I looked at, uh, we don't know what the original roof was. There is no photograph, there is no, no information about that. Um, metal roofs did exist, wooden roofs did exist. Which one was it? I couldn't tell you. But we chose to go with metal roof one. It's uh, it's reasonable. Two, it's light, and three, it does not violate any of the guidelines of the of restoration and renovation mm -hmm. uh, guidelines from the Secretary of the Interior. And so, uh, and I think uh, we had members of the historical commission there, and and one of them, the head of it said. We should use this kind of metal roof. That's what he has on his roof, and, and we'll take that into account. Uh, and, you know, we're trying to do a okay. decent job. Huh? I, think, I think I saw this before me, like when I first got on the board. It's, it's, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. It's been since like 15, I think. What? Did we try to do that? We actually looked <laughs> at a lot of different people who came to look at renovating it. And did not have a good clue as to what they were going to do. And we finally got a guy that is a barn person whose whose business is restoring, taking down old barns. One of the things that he does do is he'll take down old barns, take them to his place, and sell them, and then take them somewhere else and, and reconstruct them, put them back up. So we've got that whole thing except we're having it taken down, all of the restoration done, and then taking it back and putting it up after we get the How long should this take us okay. Just out of curiosity. That's a really good question. <laughs> I don't have a clue for you. The guy says we can get it done within uh, uh, but, Truly. Yeah, wow. But, you know, we've gotten wood. We took the L down. We've gotten wood. There's a lot of stockpile of stuff that he's got. He's going to take up to the picture. You can see where things have got to be replaced. You know, as it's opening up, mm -hmm. you also see where things were missing. There were, for instance, in all of the bays of the farm, there were longitudinal pieces that were cut out when they put some of the renovations in, when they put caps in place. Uh, and so those will get put back in. Uh, some of the other stuff, uh, there are some modern so modern on them will take out the place, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So Marshall, I'm just a little, I just, no, I mean, I was on the plan board, I think it was 2006 when you yes, came you forward. Yes, you were. And 
this kind of got changed a little bit by 213, and we held the restriction, right? Yes. On the bond. Yes. And, all, and what you're asking us for tonight is to be able to dismantle what's there so that it can be reassembled and put back up. Yes. All right. Now. Do you need a permit for that? Yes. All right. And you, and Marshall went before you uh, already, right? Yes. Yeah. So he came. Uh, he came before the planning board on December 19th, yeah. um, along with Mr. Pulaski, who is the antique bond company and provided a very long and detailed verbal description of, of what he was planning to do, and clearly it's going to be a labor of love. Um, a couple things, and, and the board was satisfied once that discussion was done that he was going to be doing it in a manner that was consistent with the building restriction that you guys hold, um, and with the intention. Um, there were a couple things that the board did ask for, was a written narrative, basically summarizing what we talked about, um, that night, and um, also if there are any changes to what Mr. Pulaski is planning to do now, if something materializes during his deconstruction or reconstruction, that those would have to come back before the town to get approved. You know, he's presented a, a picture of what he's going to do and a plan for it, but you know, something may change. And they're there already to, ready to go. And yes. I mean, where does the 60 day? You know, historic delay figure in. I mean, do we have to worry about that? The grant, the, does that kick you after we grant the ability to go after permits? Well, they're not demolishing. No, we're not them. demolishing. Okay. We're we're reconstructing. Okay. We're taking down. Look. It's looking a number of different ways. The historical commission is okay, right? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't miss Mr. Miss Howard. Yeah. Channing Howard, chair of the historical commission. We have had no involvement in this event. So you're just looking to get going. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Any other questions? All right. Is there a motion? I move to grant the permit. Second. To allow. Yeah. To allow we'll the deconstruction the yeah. and reconstruction, and pursuant to this paragraph here, what the planning board says. It would be very interesting to see as you pull it apart what you find. <laughs> Marshall, I'm just what I know, and I'm not trying to confuse this. We're granting you permission to go for a permit. Yeah. Correct. Where do you go for the permit? The building inspector. Uh, then that's we've right. we've perfect. applied for it already. Perfect. Because we hold it. Then we're right. you're, but you're going to not to us, but the building inspector for the permit. So. Correct. Uh, yep. Yeah, we have uh, it's already applied for your approval is necessary. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Oh, I do. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good luck. I'm excited Great to luck. see the outcome. Can't Me wait too. to see that happen. I don't know what you'll find. You might some, find some prehistoric cow pies. We, we've already found some very interesting stuff in there. Uh, when you get into the basement barn, you've discovered that in fact there's one way in now, there used to be two. It was a it was a run through underneath. One side has been blocked up. So, have you figured what the barn originally was? Hay, horses, horses, horses. And hay, basically hay. And, uh, you know, a lot of interesting stuff. Um, I, you know, how it was built, the saw marks, all that stuff, were what they used to date the barn from its original construction. So was it a circular pit saw or what was it? It was a straight saw, not a circular saw. Yeah. So Up and down. Some old some old stuff in there. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Master. Thanks. Thank you.
So for, the, for the record, Jeff's recusing himself from the same on, on, on right. just, just adds a little. Yep. All right. Okay, so um, do you want me to make a motion to approve? I move that we approve the following business license. Matthew Kozaski, Tender Crop Farms, 108 High Road, Retail Foods, come in particular, crafts and gifts. Second. Second, if you, if you want to Well, leave. I'm going to just do that one, and then he can accuse himself, and he can come back. Excellent. Okay. Second, please. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And Damon's going to come back. Is Damon out there, Jeff? I got it. But I have to get it. <laughs> <laughs> Musical chairs tonight. Jeff, this is the one sleeper. you're going to recuse yourself from. What am I doing? You're going to recuse yourself from this one, okay? Yep. Um, I'm going to recuse myself from this one. I move uh, Josette Walker, DBA Josette Adeloum, uh, Winston Dixie High Road, General Business. Okay, motion to approve. Sorry. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Are we just going to read through them all? No, we yeah, can. I'm going to read through them all. Uh, Anthony Barberis, AM Motors, Inc., 4 6, Liberty Port Turnpike, Motor Vehicle Class 2, Mohammed Amandani, Impact, Inc., 34 High Road, General Business, Auto Marine, Gasoline Sales, Automotive Repair, Sale of Related Goods, Vivian Anastasia Hurton, DBA Anastasia's Flowers of Maine, 56 Main Street, General Business Floral Shop, Sky Machero, Supply Dog Motor Technology, 101 New York Port Turnpike, Unit 45, Auto Marine, Gary Machero's Angie Service, Inc., 101 Newbury Port Turnpike, Unit 45, Auto Repair, Gary Machero's Angie Service, Inc., 101 Newbury Port Turnpike, Unit 45, Class 2 Used Car Dealer, Auto Works of the Hampton Falls, Inc., 88 Newbury Port Turnpike, Class 2 Used Car Dealer, Narayan Patel, DBA BGS Variety, 6D Fruit Street, Common Victua, William Victua, uh, William Koski, DBA Bills Auto Repair, 24 Middle Road, Auto Marine, subject to the restrictions and conditions of a special permit issued on 22686 in the decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals, 8699 for the property located at 24 Middle Road. Ryan Guthrie and Brendan Guthrie, DBA Blue, The Inn on the Beach, 24 and Way. Ryan Guthrie, Brendan Guthrie, DBA Blue, Inn on the Beach, 24 and Way parking lot, Ryan Guthrie, Brendan Guthrie, DBA Blue, Man on the Beach, 20 Fordham Way, parking lot, 11 Fordham Way. The other one was 77 Southern Boulevard. <coughs> John Gallant, <coughs> uh, John Gallant, <coughs> Pool and Spa, 96 New Report Turnpike, General Business, Leslie D. Matthews, Dragonfly Hill, DBA LDM Collectibles, 111 Main Street, General Business, Farm Products, Crafts, Gifts, Antiques, and Secondhand Articles. Cheryl Moulton, Danvers Butchery, 2 Morgan Ave, Carmen Victula, James Noyes, DBA Noise Auto Service, 1 Noise Lane, General Business Auto Repair, Randall Van Doyen, Trustee, DBA Old Newbury Boat Company, 84 Newbury Port Turnpike, Auto Marine, Hank Moore, Treasurer, DBA Old Newbury Golf Club, Inc., 319 Newbury Port Turnpike, Carmen Victula, um, Robin Davies, DBA Parker River Dental, 3 Kent Way, General Business, uh, Andrew Haley, DBA Parker River Marine Services, 7 Newbury Neck Road, Auto Marine, Sharon Pearson, Pearson Hardware, 6A Fruit Street, General Business, Ralph Johnson Jr., President DBA Port Lowell Company Inc., 108 Newbury Port Turnpike, Boat Restoration, Greg Pugh, Plum Island Beach Clover Restaurant, 23 Plum Island Boulevard, Common Cooler, David Williamson, Plum Island Enterprise, Williams Parking Lot, 34 Plum Island Boulevard, Parking Lot, David Williamson, Plum Island Enterprises, Williamson Parking Lot, Green Northern Boulevard, Parking Lot, Mark Friary, DBA Plum Island Grill, 2 Plum Island Boulevard, Common Victula, Angela, Angelo Giannopoulos, President, Pizza Factory, DBA Plum Island Provisions, 29 Plum Island Boulevard, Common Victula, Stephen Gadd, DBA Salter Transportation, 196 Scotland Road, General Business School Bus Transportation, John B. Siemens, DBA Sculpture by Beverly Siemens, 2 Newman Roll, General Business, Lisa Porter, Seacoast Force and Pet Sitting, 48 Old Rally Road, General Business, Dog Boarding, Dog Daycare and Pet Sitting, Brandon Kelly, DBA Store Yourself Storage, 12 Kent Way, General Business, Self Storage, Randall Vendonian, Trustee, Offshore Concepts, Conservation Trust, DBA US Number 1 Auto Marine, 
84 Newburyport Turnpike, Motor Vehicle Class 2, Geraldine Door, DBA Wheelhouse Parking, 39 Northern Boulevard, Parking Lot, Popcorn Machine, Slush Machine and Water, and Jody Wilkinson, Wilco Marine Restorations, 84 Newburyport Turnpike, General <coughs> Business Auto Marine. Motion to approve all. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Alicia. You're welcome. That last one about took me down. The last one, <laughs> holy smokes. That's a lot of, that's a lot. I'm a mom. I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Citizens concerns. Anyone want to speak to anything tonight? Okay. Seeing none. Uh, um, Administrator's report? Yep. Um, the tax rate's been set and approved by the Department of Revenue at $10.81. It's down from last year of $10.90. Uh, the budget packages were distributed and were returned to me on December 17th. So I'll be, um, well, actually, I'm already into uh, budget uh, for fiscal year 2020. Um, would, appreciate some guidance from the board as far as establishment of budget goals for that um, fiscal year. Do you have any input? I know my only input is that right now I think we need to focus on must-haves until we get a firmer grip on exactly where the police station is going to land. I'd like the, the, the police station construction committee to be able to do a little more work and share with us a little more information before we exceed from any anything that isn't a must-have. Okay. Focusing on our facilities problems is... That's actually really good. If, I, if anything comes up that wouldn't have been ancillary right now, to focus on the goal. That's good. Um, CPC has started meeting. They had uh, presentations for the purchase of a crack sealer for a little over 47000 a sander for 15000 uh, rec committee presented a uh, program for basketball courts for 105000 and the fire department presented um, a project for a radio voter site at the Byfield water tank for $60,000. Um, I think you heard an AED proposal by um, some Plum Island residents a number of months ago. They were successful in securing all the funding and the unit has been delivered and DPW will be installing it at the future Plum Island bathroom facility. <laughs> so, so they did a great job. Um, thank that you. Was Peggy Poppy and Lynn Mather. Yes. Can we send them a thank you note? Absolutely. For all that fundraising, I move we send them a note. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, the DPW was successful through Auctions International in securing some funding. Um, on previously disposed of property or you declared it surplus. So we turned it in the, or sold the 1993 John Deere voter. We got $23,000 for I that, can't. which is incredible. That sucker was so rusty, I can't believe it. <laughs> I, you're but, uh, hey. pretty shocked about <laughs> it. Someone liked it. Yeah, the uh, 96 uh, Aluma Craft Lunker got 1375 and we got $950 for our 2009 Crown Vic. But uh, tonight I wanted to ask you to make another uh, surplus declaration. They've been doing a lot, in light of the fact we haven't had a lot of snow, they've been doing a lot of cleaning out. So we've got two 30-year-old furnaces that we replaced with the waste oil furnaces. They've got one old fuel transfer tank, uh, one 40-year-old sidewalk B-plow that hasn't been used in over 25 years, one 15-year-old snapper snowblower, two electric chainsaws, one 30-year-old um, Miller portable welder, one 17-year-old brush mower, three 15-year-old backpack blowers, and one small pressure washer that we'd like to do the same thing, put it on the aquifer. Motion to declare surplus. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Let's hope one of those works 24 grand. And we can trade for a The uh, company is going to be holding its annual bonfire here on January 12th and asked that, uh, Chief Jambrin asked that um, they be granted permission to have an engine on standby throughout the event. Motion to approve. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor? 
Okay. The improvements to the fire station are underway and hopefully will be complete by the spring. Um, and we expect delivery of the bucket truck within the next four weeks. Excellent. Thank you. In the correspondence, we have more letters from Xfinity about programming that we won't, will no longer have. Uh, Star India channels and the <laughs> MGM TV channel updates, which, if I remember correctly, is Impact and a couple other ones I had never heard of. So we lose more from our cable program. Raise the prices, cut the program. Well, price will go down, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they didn't say that. <laughs> Letter from National Grid dated 12-20-2018 regarding the yearly operational plan um, brush and weed can maintenance and control. Um, and yeah, that was asking us if we had any input about where the observer sites essentially. That's what I took that letter to be about. Yeah, and it, it looks to me like they're doing the railroad bed. It may have, they did provide us a map with a couple, a couple with, spots where they were yeah. not going to spray. That all before. Yeah. yeah. So it looked like nothing terribly close to any homes and it's normal maintenance you have to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Nice of them to tell us. Right. Um, review of meeting minutes. Motion to approve September 12, 2018, Comcast public ascertainment hearing. Second. Sorry. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to approve the December 11th, 2018 minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, do we have warrants? We yes. lost. Motion to sign warrants. Aye. That's going to be a good stack, too. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It is. Um, meeting updates. Okay. So, nice holiday season on the vent I hope, for everybody. <laughs> yeah, happy New Year, everyone. I'm going to be going to the uh, next weekend, the Municipal um, Massachusetts Municipal Association meeting. And I met with the chair of the school committee. Um, <coughs> we went over all the um, other cities and towns that are in the same boat as us. Um, I don't know if you want to check the history of the <coughs> budget review to the reviews the school chapter 70 funding for public schools. The foundation budget review commission made their recommendation. Um, it hasn't been voted on by the legislature yet, but of their recommendation, Triton gets zero. And um, there is another group of people that are, well, not people, but or organizations, not districts, school districts, but organizations that are looking to increase that funding. Um, but the bottom line is that it's going to be over a billion dollars that the, gov the governor is going to have to put into public education, and I can't see that happening. So, um, of the recommend the recommendation for the foundation budget review commission, um, forty percent of the school districts in the Commonwealth will receive nothing, and sixty percent of regional school districts will receive nothing. Um, the reason for that is because it looked at four different criteria when deciding money. One of it was English language learners, um, low, in, low income, um, two other things, and I forget the other two other things were, but the bottom line, the city that's getting the most money from the foundation budget review is the city of Springfield, who is taxed with getting $98 million additional to what their school budget was. So I don't, so that's my, what I'm going to do, what I'm planning on doing is I have a list of all these cities and towns that are in the same board as us and I want to go see if I can meet with the other boards of selectmen because they're, they're all, they can't, we can't override our way out of the position. It's just a sliding scale. Much, in much bigger communities seem to be able to shout a lot louder than us. Mm -hmm. And so, anyways, that's what I'm, I'm going to do. Um, the larger communities and the larger communities that are so urban and have so many needs, they're certainly better well, it's than because of they Well, it's because they looked at those four criteria. That's what I'm saying. Right, and it, it, the cities are, are uh, Springfield, Holyoke, Chicopee, Lynn, Lawrence. Lowell, Boston, Lawrence, you know, Lawrence. Lawrence. Mm -hmm. all, those, all those big cities, which is fine, 
But what nobody seems to understand is that you have a large chunk of the rural commonwealth that is sliding down. They're, we're not sinking yet, but we're sliding down as far as our towns go that have to pay for the, for the, school, the school budget. So I, I, just, I have to just go. There are other people that are in the same boat as us. We, I just got to find, find them. Well, one of the governor's um, promises in his inaugural speech was to tackle the foundation. Right. Budget. Well, that's the foundation. And they, they did. But their recommendation. Well, it's still on. We still get on, nothing. It's still ongoing. To, right. Yeah. Well, they're not going to. I don't think they're ever going to. My hope was that they were going to take that foundation budget for, formula, blow it up, and do something that was more fair and equitable to everyone. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think they've got their little thing here. They think they're going to help. Um, but I still think Brockton, there's still a couple other towns that, Worcester and Brockton, and I don't know who else, a couple of cities that still, even though they are on the giving end of, or the receiving end of all that money, I don't think they see it reasonably happening because it's all probably subject to appropriation and it probably won't get appropriated. So I think they're still looking at a lawsuit. So it's going to be kind of like the McDuffie of the 1993 ed, ed reform. So that's, that's they've hired counsel, they're building a case. So the whole Chapter 70 public education is in a term of trauma. So one of the things that I signed up to do on Saturday is to go to the municipal selectmen's. They have, so they kind of separated the cities and the towns. So the selectmen is all about Chapter 70 and how it affects your, t your, your, your budget. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna get a front seat. <laughs> Sounds like a lovely day. And I'm gonna ask questions. Hmm. I mean, it's probably gonna cause some controversy, but I'm glad we're sitting in the position we are right now as a town of Newbridge. Well, we're not in a very good position. Well, we're in a better position right now than we were in years past. Yeah, but that that may rotate back and we may be in, a, in that we'll, we'll, we'll seat. wait for that. All right, any other meeting updates? Okay. No. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion to adjourn. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, everybody.